sing this wonderful, beautiful hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I just want to sing 
Oh, in the back. I'd like to hey. introduce them. Oh, you're going to know that, right? We know you. Yeah. Hi, right, everyone. Good morning. Um, this is my brother, Anthony, from Santa Cruz, California, visiting Montana, and my sister, Lynette, and she's a miracle, and I can't introduce her without telling you about all the miracles that happened in her life. When she was five, she was diagnosed with an almost inoperable brain tumor, and we were told by a famous neurosurgeon that she was going to die. Um, before the internet, we got her on prayer chains all over the country, all over churches, just word of mouth. And she survived the surgery, had subsequent surgeries. When she was 12, the tumor came back, um, and another eight hours of surgery, and, you know, it's just God isn't done with her yet on this planet. So praise God, she's a miracle. And then she went on to graduate from a community college, and people with her abilities, because of all the brain tumors and lifetime of brain radiation that she had, she was one of 4% in the nation that graduated from a community wow. college. So wow. I just give all the glory to Jesus. What a great testimony you have. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, any others? Are yeah. here? None? Okay, let's go on. We uh, look at the upcoming uh, on April 15th, the Good Friday service. April 17th is the sunrise service uh, with a breakfast at 8.30, Sunday school at 9.15, and Easter yeah. worship service. Are we going to be able to get in the new sanctuary on that day? Don't know yet. We don't have occupancy permit, huh? Yeah, okay. All right, and uh, Diana wants all the Easter choir to stay after church. Don't forget that, please. Birthdays. Alex stayed home today. That's what uh, Scott and Ann told me this morning. But so anyway, tell him we, we wish him a happy birthday. And we got Josie Wilder. I don't, don't think she's here. And, but we have Mike Smith. Mike Smith is here. How many, Mike? A few. A few? Oh. That's not fair. Is it more than 50?
is uh, second coming of Christ. This will be the third time I have talked about it in the last one. It's a big subject. I really cannot cover it to any great degree uh, as a devotion. It, it really needs to be a, a long, multi-Sunday class that somebody will preach. Um, Everybody believe in the second coming of Christ? Yeah. You should. Why is that? Because you have Bible. All right. Jesus himself in Matthew 26, 64 made the statement. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man seen it at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Wow. Do we really know what it means? Not totally. But in any case, the point is that Jesus will return. <coughs> That's what you really have to get out of that, that, that verse. And also in Acts. Acts 1, 9 through 11. It is foretold. This is a, a scripture of the ascension when Christ goes to heaven. But look what it says right at the end. After he had said this, he was taken up as it were watching. And a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So it's going to happen again. There's another time it's mentioned in the Bible. And by the way, just as a side note, it talks in here about being taken up. That's uh, a phrase used in other parts of the body, too. The Latin term for that sounds very much like the word rapture. Rapture is the term to describe the taking of Christians from the earth in a moment. As if you will have an airplane with no pilot or co-pilot all at once, or any of us could be taken up. Hopefully all of us would be. But it would be an instantaneous event. And that is called the rapture. The word rapture is not listed in the Bible. It comes from this, or taken up. There is one other scripture I want to share with you. One of them that we talk about a lot. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the comfort of Christ's coming. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. They don't have a hope. Christians have a hope. We have our hope in the Lord. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way through Jesus, God will bring him with those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up, there's that word, caught up, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's remember that.
copy out of a book some um, information. If you're really interested in this, you want to learn more about it, this is a, a handout on views of the end time. There's four different views that are currently recognized by biblical scholars. Big words. Historical premillennialism. A millennialism. Dispensational premillennialism. And postmillennialism. All of those are adequately described in here. And a nice little chart showing you how they fit together. At least the way that each group believes. So if you're interested in it, there are uh, 20 copies over here. And uh, take one per family, please. Okay? Appreciate it very much. And I'm sorry I didn't bring four red scripture. Normally I do that. So, all right. Uh, now we're going to our prayer time. And I would like to start off just by saying one thing. I'm sure that all of us uh, know what's been going on for the last uh, two weeks, 18 days now. If you don't know that Russia attacked Ukraine for no apparent reason and is demolishing the country and killing people left and right, then you've been in a vacuum for a long time. I really, honestly, my personal opinion, I don't see how the civilized world can remain and not respond to this atrocity that is taking place. How can we ignore it? Whether they are a member of NATO, I know the reason for it. We don't want to get Putin riled up to where he's going to use his nuclear weapon. Well, he's going to do that anyway. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. I better shut up. Who's won't like that? I know. So anyway, we do need to remember Ukraine because uh, total havoc, desolation in the country is taking place. Do we have other prayer requests this morning? Yes. Um, the chef from Double Arrow, Joel Rosner, is suffering from uh, colon cancer. And they are flying to Mexico this week um, to a hospital in Mexico who will do some alternative treatments on him. And basically, this is, unless God performs a miracle, this will be his last chance to clear his body of cancer. So prayers for him will be gone for three weeks. Wow. OK. I hope that works out. Any others? <coughs> yes. we left up this young man that's going for COVID cancer treatment in Mexico. We just ask your blessing on him, but to us to all the blessing on those that will be administering the treatment. We pray that uh, there will be positive results from it. 
We pray that your healing hand of mercy will be on him. Because you are the great healer, Father. Whatever the situation, we know that you are able to take care of him. Father, we just pray that you be with him during this time. And thank you for Debbie. As we said, she's a walking miracle because of your grace. Thank you so very much, Father. We pray for our country, for our leaders, for wise and mature decisions to be made. We pray that the great falling away that is taking place in parts of the world, including this country, will reverse and will truly go back to you, Father. But we know the scripture tells us that's going to happen for the second coming of Christ. And what's true will be false, and what is false will be true. We're experiencing that too. So many bad things going on, Father. Thank you. We live here in the Swan Valley in Montana. And thank you, Father, that at the conclusion of this service, we can all go home in peace. We're not going to have any bombs falling or rockets. Our homes won't be destroyed, destroyed while we're there or while we're here. Not like up in other parts of the world. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you've given us in our lives right here. In Christ's name we pray. Please stand once again and let's sing together. This time you don't need your hymnals. You can sing directly from the screen. Speak, O oh Lord.
nice to see everybody here this morning, and especially want to welcome our visitors. We're so glad to have you folks here with us today. I want to welcome those that will be uh, watching this later on in YouTube. We're glad that you can participate in that manner also. So, um, before we go any further, we're going to we're going to go to our offering time here just really quick. But two things I want to mention. Buzz prompted me this morning. We are. We just finished a study in Sunday school, so we're going to start a new one next week. And I, I've been praying that God would reveal to me. He's kind of led me in, in kind of two different directions. I hadn't decided for sure, but after listening to Buzz this morning, why I'm fairly certain that we're going to go into a simple study on eschatology next Sunday in church. And I and I say, you know, it's going to be simple because I'm going to teach it. All right. And uh, I said one time years ago, I make bold statements, and I said I was never going to do a study on eschatology because I've been through a couple of them that frustrated me to death. There was just too much of human opinion and philosophy and not enough of just what the Bible says. There is a lot, folks, that we're not going to understand. But I would invite you to come at 9.15 next Sunday because we're going to start it. And there's a lot we can't understand. Get used to this phrase, I don't know, okay? because you're going to hear that so I'll tell you the truth. And the other thing is, we also just finished the book of Malachi in our Wednesday night, our new Wednesday night Bible study. We're clever the way we name things, aren't we? Tuesday night Bible study, now Wednesday night Bible study. So. And uh, Leon leads us in that, and we're going to go into the book of Matthew. And if you're a New Testament scholar, you know... When we get to chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, Leon is going to explain in detail about end times and the second coming of Christ. So you've got that to look forward to. So let's go ahead and, uh, and let's take an offering now. And uh, Tom, I know you're out there somewhere. Chuck snuck up behind me here. Don, would you come and give uh, Tom a hand, please? I get nervous when you walk up yeah, behind me, sorry. buddy. You know? <laughs> Tom, would you offer a Don, thank you. Let's pray. Father, just once again, we just thank you for the privilege that we can be here today and in relative peace. And we just thank you for the opportunity as well to give these tithes and offerings. We'd ask that you would bless them and use them to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everything, or 
main thing, I guess I would say, uh, besides the leading of, of God that a pastor needs, is a strong and an encouraging wife. And so Carolyn, first thing, you know, every Monday, this, this process, getting ready for Sunday, starts again on Monday, and she's real faithful to go in and read the next verses that we're going to go to, and she can pray about it, and she can kind of pick out hymnals and that sort of thing. And so this Monday she did that as usual, and she come downstairs after she read the verses, and she said, I just read your verses for next week. And I said, yeah. And she said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we know luck has nothing to do with it. It's all God's leading and God's direction. And so pray for that today. I told the elders this morning when we were praying, I am really looking forward to chapter 8 of Romans. So, but we're going we're gonna to do our best, and God's going to guide us through the rest of this chapter 7. Today, Paul is going to start off, he's going to ask, a, ask us a question, he's going to very simply say, is the law sin? You know, if you were here last Sunday, you know in these first six verses that Paul told us, quite simply, that the law was something that we need in a manner to be freed from. And that prior to our conversion, prior to our death to sin through the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were tied to the law. We were tied to our own sin nature, but now we have been freed from the law through Christ's crucifixion. Now having said all this, when we get to today's verses, the apostle seems to think that some people may come away with the conclusion that this law that we needed to be released from in itself is a bad thing, is a sin. And so... We're going to go on and we're going to discuss that today. Romans 7, and we're going to look at verses 7 through 12. And as always, before we go to Scripture, let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, I do lift this time up to you now, Lord. And I pray for, for just clarity of your word here, Father, through the work of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would set me aside completely now, Father, and speak through me. Open all of our hearts and minds to what we find in your scripture today, Father, and I pray that we would earnestly take it into our hearts and minds, Father, and help us to just live our life in a manner that you would, you would call us to, Father. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 7, what shall we say then is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then, the law is holy, the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Well, Paul answers this question very briefly, doesn't he? Is the law sin, and he says, may it never be. There's nothing wrong with God's law. What we need to understand is what is the purpose of God's law. And that is to show us the character of sin. That's the only way, if we, get, we need to come to understand that, because that's the only way we're going to understand some of the statements that the apostle is going to make in today's verses. For example, in verse 7, he said, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. And I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. This means that the very concept of coveting, the sin of coveting, is outlined in the law. And without being plainly spelled out in the law, Paul would not have understood what it meant to covet. He wouldn't have understood that coveting is a sin. And I think that's still a big issue today, particularly for some Christians and maybe and certainly for non-believers, I don't think that many of them believe this idea that having an overarching desire 
to have things, whatever it might be, comes to the point that it becomes sin. Second, the law reveals sin in us. Look at verse 8. The apostle says, for apart from the law, sin is dead. This phrase tells us, when we clearly understand God's commandments through the law, it actually stirs up sin in our hearts, showing us not just what sin is, but how sin resides within us. Paul is describing a situation in which he found that the more he tried to avoid the sin of coveting, the more he coveted. <clears throat> so beyond showing us, just showing us our sins, Paul is saying that the law actually provokes sin in us. I'm going to do my best to explain that. But verse 8, sin taking the opportunity through the commandment produced in me a coveting of every kind. So we ask, well, how does well, this happen? What, what is the apostle talking about here? The answer is that there is a perversity in our hearts. And defining perversity, it is the desire to do something for no other reason than it is forbidden. It is the joy in wrongdoing for the sake of wrongdoing. Paul's point is that until the command came against doing evil, until it comes to us, we may feel little urge to do whatever it is that it's commanding us not to do. But when we hear the command, our natural perversity is stirred up, and they take over. And I would argue, I suppose like all said, that this is worse in some people than it is in others, and I have a classic example. Myself is the bad example. My lovely wife is the good example. When I think back into school, and I went for four years, went through high school with Carolyn, she is the kind of young lady at that time that you could go up to, and you could say, a bunch of us are going to come out and do this. You think of, add whatever you want to. A bunch of us are going to do this. And Carolyn would say, I'm not going to do that. She would say, why? It's against the rules. I would say, well, of course it's against the rules. That's why we're going to do it. <laughs> she was what we call a goody two-shoes. <laughs> but I, I know she's an example of that. Okay. I think, particularly, I think about my junior high age. We really did. Me and a couple of my friends. We, I didn't think of it in those terms, but boy, it came home this week when I was working on this message did stuff just because we were not supposed to do it. And the 7th and 8th grade, I went to this little school, I always told you, like this one down here, and we had a Mr. Gerstenberger, you all remember Mr. Gerstenberger? <laughs> he was teacher I ever had. He was a school principal, he was a 7th and 8th grade teacher, and he was the boys' athletic coach. Really, really a big guy. We, we all loved him so much, we wouldn't lie to him. We would go out and do something stupid, we would break something, and he would say, we had about 100 kids in, in uh, the school, all 8th grade. And he would say, I am going to line every kid in the school up outside of my office, and I'm going to call you in one at a time, and I'm going to ask you if you did this. And if you don't admit it, you're going to have to lie to me. And then he'd go, the first three are Schmidt, Buchanan, and Rippy. <laughs> <laughs> never went any further than that. And, and we never lied to him. I don't think we're dumb. Why, I thought, why did we why did we do stuff? We we're gonna tell him the truth when he called us in. He didn't line up full school, he didn't have to. That's the idea of what Paul is talking about here. And Augustine had he had a classic analysis in his confessions. He described a time when he stole some pears. He said he was him and some boys got together and they just got the urge to go out and steal these pears. And he said, We had pears in our own vineyard and the pears that we had were better color, they were better tasting, but we just decided to go out and steal pears because it was something that we weren't supposed to do. So they went out late at night, they shook the tree, they knocked all the pears off they could, they picked them all up, and they took them away. And he said, we didn't eat hardly any of them. We may have tasted one or two of them, but, but they weren't all that good. He said, the only reason that, and they threw them to the pigs, by the way, after that, and he said, the only reason we did that was to become a thief. 
And in the end, we threw them all away, and all I tasted in them, he said, was my own iniquity, and I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> the desire to do something because it's against the rules, because it's forbidden. Augustine went on to say that there is always a depth motive for every sin. When a person lies or steals, there's always some superficial motive, their greed, anger, whatever it might be. But Augustine's experience with the pear tree and his study of scripture showed him that there is a deeper underlying motive to sin. And he says that ultimately it is a desire to play God. We desire to be in charge of our world. We desire to be in charge of our own lives. We want to be sovereign. And every law that God lays down at some level, we feel that it's an infringement on our sovereignty. And it reminds us that we're not God. I remember the old saying, I've always hung on to this, the old guy said, in all the years I've lived, there's only two things that I've learned. One, there is a God, and two, I'm not him. <laughs> that goes against our nature. It's in... It's in its essence, sin is a force that hates to be infringed upon. If you remember back to Genesis 3, the very first temptation in the, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent, Satan himself, told Eve, you will be like God. You will be like God. That's the essence of the first sin. It's still the essence of sin today. In verse 9, Paul said, there was a time... That he was alive apart from the law. Well, certainly he seems, it says a time, once, he seems to be referring to a past experience. Then there's been a lot of discussion as to exactly what the apostle meant here. You see, if you've studied Old Testament history and you understand the Pharisees, which, which Paul uh, grew up to become, it would be impossible for a Jewish boy from a devout family to at, any, to at any time been a part from the law in the sense that he didn't know about the law. So almost certainly when he uses this phrase apart from the law, he meant that he had never realized completely what the demands of the law really required. He saw a ton of rules. He saw a ton of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. But not the basic demands. He had no understanding prior to his conversion. He had no understanding of holiness, of what it meant to love God supremely, of what it meant to love his neighbor as himself. Thus, he was apart from the law, even though he knew the law, the letter of the law, inside and out. And what does it mean when he says, I was alive? It's probably a reference to his own self-perception. He felt he was spiritually alive thought that he was pleasing and satisfying to God. He's telling us that this perception of being alive was one of ignorance of what the law really demanded. And so he says, when the commandment came, I died. That would mean that subsequently something happened to show him that he wasn't pleasing to God at all. And in very graphic language, he said, I realized I was dead spiritually dead. I thought I was doing quite well spiritually. I felt good or better than most, but then I was overwhelmed with a sense of failure and condemnation. So we ask what caused this change of consciousness. Verse 9, he says, the commandment came. Now it is obvious, those of you that are Old Testament scholars, you'll know that God's commandments were given centuries before Paul actually lived. So he could not have been talking about the commandments coming into the world for the first time. Instead, he must mean that the commandment had come home to him. Now the demands of the moral law had really hit him. He had come to understand what is often called a conviction to sin. This is something that, you know, we've talked about, we struggle with in our own life. Paul mentally understood the law. He understood the letter of the law. He had it up here. But 
But God's demands for the law, what he wanted to see accomplished by the law, had never made it in here. Had never made it into his heart. And now Paul has come to that point where it has made that trip from the head to the heart. Now remember, this doesn't mean that, that at no time had Paul seen that he had sinned or that he hadn't seen the commandments before, but rather he realized that he was dead, spiritually dead, condemned, lost, because of his complete failure and inability to keep the law of God. He'd been a proud Pharisee, and he was sure of his standing before God until he read the law and realized that he was a sinner and that he was in serious trouble. To die in this sense means that you see your own moral failures. You see that you're lost. And you see that you cannot save yourself. Verse 7 suggests that the commandment that killed Paul was you shall not covet. And that is not surprising. Again, if you've studied the Old Testament and you know that Paul, prior to his conversion, had been a Pharisee. And the Pharisees thought of sin only in terms of external action. They felt that as long as you didn't perform, actually perform an evil act, that you were not guilty of sin. And this made it far easier to think of yourself as an obedient, law-abiding person. But when Jesus came, you know, you look particularly in the book of Matthew, or the Gospel of Matthew 5, you know, when Jesus came, he referred to all Ten Commandments, not only as a matter of behavior, but as a matter of attitude and motive. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 21, You have heard it said, do not murder. But if you go on and you read the rest of the text there, he also says, that means that we shouldn't hate our neighbors. When we hate people, we have committed murder in our heart. But you could go to Exodus, and you could go to chapter 20, and you could look right up there, and you could just read those Ten Commandments, and it's easy to look at them just in terms of the external. You could easily tick them off and feel like that you're spiritually alive. You could look at them, and you could say, well, I haven't worshipped other gods. I haven't made an idol. I haven't taken God's name in vain. I, I come to church on Sunday. I haven't spoke against my father and mother. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen them. You could sit there and you could tick them off. And you could think I'm doing fine. In other words, you can interpret the law superficially, seeing them as simply behavioral rules, which makes them much easier to keep. That is until you reach that tip commandment right there. Thou shalt not covet. You can't reduce that commandment to a matter of just externals. You shall not covet it has everything to do with inward attitudes. To covet is to be discontented with what God has given you. To covet includes envy, self-pity, and grumbling. Coveting is not simply wanting. It is an idolatrous desire for anything. Wealth, power, approval, popularity, wanting more than what God has blessed you with to an extreme. Now, it, it's not wrong to have a desire for some of these things, but if you become bitter, and you become downcast when you don't achieve them, it's because your desire for them has become idolatrous coveting. In the scripture, Satan is called the great deceiver. And because of this, you're never going to hear Satan say, do this and suffer. You're never going to hear him say, do this and die. Human passions are so excited by sin, that we come to believe that unless we act on those passions, we'll be denying ourselves fundamental happiness. Sin is attractive. Listen to this, folks. Sin is attractive because it brings pleasure. It 
brings pleasure, but it never brings happiness. You understand the difference? That's important. When it brings pleasure, but it never, ever <coughs> brings happiness. That's the monstrous lie of Satan. Do this and you'll be happy. It is impossible for sin to bring happiness, yet we act as if we do not believe it. I will not be happy unless I do this. I will not be happy unless I have that. That is how sin deceives us. Going back to Genesis 3, the serpent told Eve, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. In other words, if I was to paraphrase that, I can see Satan saying, Adam, you don't know what happiness is. And you won't if you don't taste this fruit. Eve, you don't know what pleasure is. And you're never going to know if you don't taste the fruit. Sin tells us that God is withholding happiness and that we have the right to be happy. You know, I think one of the biggest moral justifications in the secular culture today for all kinds of monstrous evil is the insistence that we have the right. We have the right. I have the right to marry whoever I want in whatever manner I choose. I have the right over my own body, so I have the right to destroy a baby. I have the right to choose who I am biologically. Where did you get that right? Who gave you those rights? The government? Some court? Just society in general because it's popular? Well, let me ask you. Did government establish marriage? Did society make them male and female? Did the courts create you or the children that you claim it's okay to destroy? Did God give us any of those rights? We know better. And you know what? I think that on some level, every person who has ever lived knows better. They know better than that. But they say, if I do not do this, I will. We do evil things, we destroy all hope of happiness. We cannot get our minds wrapped around the difference between temporary pleasure and long-term happiness. Paul's point through these verses that we've gone through today is that while the law should help us to recognize our sin, it cannot save us. And that, folks, was never, ever the purpose of the law. But it can and it must show us that we need to be saved, that we are sinners, that we need a Savior. And unless the law does its work, we will not look to Christ. We'll be in denial about the depth and the nature of our sin. In other words, we need the law to convict us of our sin so that we can see our need for the grace of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I hope you have found that in your life. I hope you have come to understand that there's absolutely nothing you can do in your life on your own to save yourself, save accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I hope you've taken that step. Continue to pray for revival. Pray that it will start right here in this church. Pray that God would use the awfulness going on in the world that Buzz spoke about this morning to bring the world to Him. And if you've selected a somebody, a family, or group to pray for, please continue to do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this body of believers. I thank you, Father, just for their eagerness and their willingness to serve you in the way that they do. Just strengthen us and encourage us, Father. Just help us to be powerful witness for you, to take seriously 
the work that you have given us to be your representatives here in this fallen and lost world, Father. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to have a closing hymn, and then Leon, would you close this in a word of prayer, please? Please stand and turn in your hymnals to number 408. All to Jesus I surrender.